Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Tunnel Vision, a show brought to you by uscfootball.com. I'm your host, Keely Orr, joined by Ryan Abraham and soon to be Taylor Mays. And we're just tweeting out the story of this show. Sorry, we just started it. Yeah, we don't have uh, our buddy Taylor Mays, so he'll be here, former USC All American and uh, NFL safety. Taylor Mays is uh, talked, we reached out recently. We saw him at a few USC football practices. He had a little interest in uh, getting in to be in, uh, in the media. And, uh, you know, we sort of helped Max Brown with that a little <laughs> bit. And he's now going to be on the USC broadcast. So we thought we'd uh, bring Taylor in. He was, been, I guess he's been in the car for about two hours trying to get down here from the Beverly Center. LA traffic gets everybody. It's a little bad. But so he should be here in a few minutes. And then uh, he'll just kind of, hopefully he can find our office and jump right in. So maybe about 10 minutes or so. <laughs> So Keely and I will just talk a little first, hey. and then we'll bring in Taylor. But. Whatever works, boss man. Uh, but we have a lot to talk about, actually, Ryan. Uh, USC on Tuesday named a starting quarterback. JT Daniels will be the starter. Wait, name the starter for the second time. Yes, oh. yes. I, name mean, I, missed, I must have missed that. Yeah. yeah, maybe. And then the backup, Keenan Slovis, which has surprised some people, Ryan. A little bit. Um, and then the order goes Matt Fink, then Jack Sears. We got to talk to Matt Fink, Keenan Slovis, JT Daniels, and Graham Harris. And Clay Hilton this week about that decision. It was a lot of offensive heavy week just because that decision uh, came on Tuesday. So we'll discuss that. Uh, of course, we'll be talking to Taylor Mays uh, and talking about USC's defense. Is there concern with USC's secondary, specifically those young corners? Uh, we might get Taylor's opinion on that. He was talking we to yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we, he was talking to some of the safeties at practice. He's been at practice uh, a couple times so far this fall. Uh, so it'll be good to get his opinion on that. But Ryan. Hot take, man. <laughs> Hot take, your, man. What were your thoughts on USC's quarterback uh, timing as far as the decision and uh, the depth chart of how it all shook out? Well, I think we came on the show Sunday where we were talking about it. and Or maybe it was, a, was it the podcast we were talking? I don't remember what it was. This podcast, the podcast, I believe. So what, I think some of the things we got right were, and, and you guys talked about this on the Family Feud. I'll have to plug it since Shotgun's not hey, here. Thank I you. think we talked about it on this show when we watched the – uh, scrimmage, the fall showcase from last week, JT Daniels had a lot more reps, but there was a reason for that. It wasn't that he got a whole bunch more series. He had one like half series extra than the rest of the guys. But when he was in there, he was completing short passes. He had more completions, more attempts um, at a, in the same amount of series, but he was moving the ball methodically down the field, picking up first downs where the other, the other uh, quarterbacks for the most part, there'd be some bad plays and then they would hit a big play. And that's sort of where a lot of the yards came from. Now, JT Daniels had one, too. It was a third and long. He ended up hitting Eric Krummenhoek for a touchdown, sort of a desperation throw. But, you know, whatever. That, that, there were situations that happened. But in general, JT Daniels moved the ball down the field more. And what was that? What did we talk about that being? He was more consistent. And then when you guys got to talk to Graham Harrell yesterday, that was the word of the day. Consistent, consistent, consistent. So I feel like we got that right. When I, when I was asked about when is he going to make a decision, I didn't feel he was going to narrow it down. I thought it was going to be one fail swoop. That was right. You I was wrong. Right. I didn't get it right about when they were going to do it. He did it this week. So we thought they might wait until after mock game week. Yeah. Um, did you think they were going to do it this week? Or? I said if I was Clay Helton, I would want to do it on Tuesday. So I don't know if that counts. because I counts, sure. I, I kind of thought that it was going to be after Saturday's like walkthrough type scrimmage because that's usually when they name the captain so I thought maybe it might be a full announcement type yeah. situation but um I thought it was pretty good for both of uh to have that decision and not have it have it keep going just because Dan and I Dan Weber and I had said on instant analysis splitting up those reps is just not beneficiary for no. anyone on the on the offense yeah he's going to get about 60 percent of the first team reps and I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and that's something that they needed to be able to do. I like the timing of when it happened. I wasn't sure they would. So I think that's a positive sign where I didn't think they would make a decision this early. And they did. And then you kind of move forward uh, with JT Daniels getting the majority of the first team rep. So I feel like that's uh, a good thing for USC. Uh, you're going to get Keaton Slovis getting in there some. Doesn't look like Jack Sears being the four-string quarterback is going to really get any team reps he'll be going through warm-ups and stuff and that's it Matt Fink will get a little bit as as the third team guy I think it kind of needed to happen now because you know we talked to Michael Pittman before and he didn't get a whole lot of reps heading into last year so you get two weeks of JT Daniels being the guy getting the most reps with the uh first team offense and especially the first team uh uh the the receivers and stuff so they all have to be on the same page because when this offense is clicking 
it's not just about here what the play is called. The receiver is going to, like we said a million times, run to grass. And the, the quarterback has to kind of figure out what he's doing. You know, what, is he going to make that move? That's an open spot there. I have confidence Michael Pittman's going to find it, and I'm just going to throw the ball and deliver it. So they got to be on the same page. A couple weeks of the majority of the reps going to JT Daniels, I think, I think is a good thing. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, and if you're just joining us now, Taylor Mays is on his way in a couple minutes. He got stuck in LA traffic, yeah. like some people. It, it happens. It happens. Uh, but Ryan, were you shocked at all by Keen Slovis at number two? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, we saw, I thought he played well when I saw him throughout fall camp. And we talked about this off the air. Once the scrimmage stuff happened, though, it wasn't like he was, I, I don't think he was as good as the other guys. You know, that uh, Matt Fink threw some better balls. I think Jack Sears did some some good things. And I, you know, and we talked about this, like potentially Slovis would be the number four guy, and he's not. And uh, Graham Harrell apparently loves uh, Keaton Slovis. And, you know, so it seems to fit the system uh, that he wants. Now, is there something else going on here? You know, Jack Sears is going to graduate in December. Uh, does he know if it was basically an all or nothing for him? If he if he was named the starter, he's in. If not, he didn't even care about being the backup. He was going to transfer out anyway, so he's not going to be in the top you know top three or whatever. Maybe something like that's going on behind the scenes. He didn't talk uh, yesterday, as you mentioned, so uh, really hard to say. Well, you know, we'll see you know, if we hear from him. Uh, down the road, but a little, little bit shocking, I guess you could say that he's going to be the number two guy. But will he really be if something you know catastrophic happens to JT Daniels early on? Do you really want your true freshman in there? Because we've seen Matt Fink and we've seen Jack Sears in games do pretty well when they had yeah. to come in. Um, Jack Sears did get the start. Matt Fink would have had the start. I did find it interesting that two years in a row, a lot of people were clamoring for Jack Sears to be like the starting quarterback, and he was still behind Matt Fink. So yeah. last year he was, and this year. I don't know did you, if you expected that, Keely, or what did you think? I mean, the thing about Jack Sears is it, it just the consistency is not there. It's not – I feel like some people who – a lot of Twitter acts like they've seen practice, even though there's a select few that have seen practice. And, and Jack Sears just hasn't been consistent enough where I think the coaches would be confident to put him in to a game and know exactly – what you'll get with him. Now, granted, he's more of a game type of player rather than a practice player, kind of similar to S Sam Darnold in that sense. But I just don't think that... I think S Matt Fink made significant leaps between uh, even two springs ago just to this spring to, to fall. So I, I did see why they put Matt Fink third, but I part of me wonders if you put Jack Sears fourth, it gives a clear signal to him, hey... It's probably time for you, if you want to continue your football career, to look elsewhere. There's no doubt about it. Because if you put Jack Sears second, do you keep – do you – he has – transfer anyway. Yeah, yeah, like do you keep it doubt in his mind? Should I stay here? Should I not? Um, if he transfers anyway, then how do you – you know, like you said. So I wonder if that was just a, a signal of like, hey, we've made up our minds and now we're letting you make up yours in yeah. that sense. It's curious if it was a USC side thing or a Jack Sears thing. Like, hey – I don't even want to be number two. If I'm not number one, that's fine, but I'm going to graduate and move on. He'll have two years to play two, so he could do a very similar thing to what Max Brown uh, did there. So, yeah, I mean, curious to see how it shakes out. You got Bryce Young coming in. Yeah. Uh, there's, I mean, this is just the, the nature of college football now. You're seeing high-profile guys and some non-high-profile guys transferring uh, out of the program. And the quarterback is a weird spot because there's only one. You know, you could be the third, you know, number three wide receiver and catch 100 balls. You know, they, you're not doing that if you're a quarterback. So, yeah, they want to go someplace where they can play. And I think he's got a lot of talent that can do it. And he definitely has his supporters. And some yeah. people feel like there's players on the team that really want to see Jack Sears. I know people have been kind of talking about that. But, you know, we, from what we've seen, JT Daniels has performed better. Like, that's all we can tell you yeah. from what we saw. And I know a lot of people put so much stock into that Arizona State game. And that's great. You know, after the, you know, a little slower start, I thought he played really well. But the coaches said they cut the playbook in half for that. Yeah. And basically they did the same thing for JT Daniels when he played Notre Dame. And he played the best of any quarterback all year against Notre Dame who went to the playoffs. So if you simplify the offense and make it easier for the quarterback to run – JT Daniels probably would have had a better year. Jack Sears got that one game, and it, it looked good. And uh, and he lost that game still. That was something <laughs> – he didn't win that game, and that's a lot. That's the game that people always point to. Yeah. Um, I'm not blaming him for losing that game, but there's – I mean, there was a lot of factors in that. But True. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, they didn't he have, like, a pitch on, like, the second play that – 
fumbled or something. Dan yeah. was reminding me of that. But anyway, the funny thing about Keaton is that he was he. We asked him like, "What was your reaction to being named second? Like, did people at home t- to say things to you?" And he's like, "Yeah, everyone kept congratulating me." And I was like, "Guys, I'm still number two. I didn't actually win the job." But yeah. what do you take away from Graham Harrell's comments about Keaton? Because it seems like he's really invested in, in Keaton. And I know you question whether or not if something does uh, unfortunately happen to JT in the game or something like that, would you really put in Keaton? And and Dan actually asked Graham Harrell that and he said we wouldn't name him the backup quarterback if we hadn't so yeah. i mean it seems like there's a, a a big liking to uh keaton yeah no he, it's like i don't want to say it's a whole clay helton to a lobandon kind of uh, love of my life sort of thing oh. but there's definitely a, there, graham harrell likes him and sometimes when you're a new coach coming in it's easier to get attached to the freshman that hasn't really been tampered with from the previous coaching staff i don't know maybe something like that but i think he fits that system that he wants to run, that, that you know, that Graham Harrell wants to run really well. So yeah. uh, that's probably that's the biggest factor. Probably, I believe we have a, we have special, a special guest in the studio. Come on over, Taylor. Da, 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 He's da, da, da. here. He's got his SC hat on. Everything here we go. <laughs> Thanks for coming, man. I had to put on something that that said USC. Good to see you, sir. Well, look who it is. Hey. Yeah. Hello, we- hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You haven't met Keely before. Huh? No, I haven't. Hello. Hi. <laughs> nice I don't know. You. I watched uh, I was telling y'all watched the show online, so. So you kind of know. I got a little bit of an idea. You got That's an idea. That's why I wore a hat, because Shotgun wore a hat. <laughs> he well, always wore a hat. He was on backwards, though. He yeah. wears hats. He That's wore a hat true. at his wedding, so that was. Oh, not, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which we were at and stuff, yeah, but. Right. Well, Taylor, welcome to the show. What's going on? We're, it's glad to see you back around the USC campus. What's it like for you to be back and in, in, around practice again? Well, at first I was upset because they built the new uh, facilities, the facilities, yeah. the uh, the university village, and I was looking like, man, this they they were promising us that <laughs> back when I was getting recruited, <laughs> and at least they finally came through on their promise. But uh, it it's a trip to be back. Um, it's it's a little bit nostalgic, but at the same time, uh, it's crazy how fast the time goes. Yeah. It's been uh, it's 2019. I left in 2009, 2010. Ten years ago. Ten years, yeah. yeah. Oh, nine, it, ten it, years ago. Yeah. Man, it's just, it goes by so fast, and it's crazy. Guys come in, there's, you know, you're here, you're a football player, and then you're gone, and new guys come in, and you kind of just, it's it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, John McKay Center is really nice. You yes. get to go. You, I know you checked yeah. out some of the stuff there. Of yeah. course, the University Village. Uh, even Keely, like Keely graduated a couple of years ago, I and did. she's she was envious because like all you know, the, they have dorms in there where you have Trader Joe's and uh, Target <laughs> and stuff I feel. right there. It's That's how crazy. I feel. It, it was. Not, I mean, <laughs> this is this is my thing. Uh, it's like a Rocky movie. You know, in a Rocky movie when. He went and trained in Russia in a cabin and <laughs> just ate or drank uh, egg whites and yeah. kind of just the knit and grit tough. That was the USC of before. Now it's like, you know, USC's came to the 21st century and yeah. now everything's nice and automated and electronic. It's Apollo Creed with that's the I mean. flag <laughs> yeah, that's, around. That's He's exactly like what all, I'm saying. Yeah, doing yeah, all yeah, living in America. Show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Great, great movies, by the way. Yeah, yeah for good, sure. Yeah. You mentioned 2009. You were recently honored at the Coliseum. I guess it was a, a week ago uh, at the showcase. How was that for you? It was It was great. Well, it was cool to see the Coliseum's uh, upgrades yeah. also. Yeah. Uh, a replay board, uh, the new press box signed. Um, it just was cool. It was great to see some of the other guys that I've played with over the years and uh, to see and talk to them about what they've been doing and kind of just be there uh, together as a group. That was a special moment. You're, you're coming off your NFL career. So, you, I mean, you look good. You're in shape. You were just playing yeah, and stuff. Yeah. What about some of the guys from the 2019? Well, so, who look good? Who looks good? So here's the thing. And, and I've <laughs> talked to – my dad uh, played in the NFL also. So we've talked about this a lot. You know, especially for guys, for linemen, it can go – one way or the other. <laughs> Some guys, you know, they get big and they blow up, and other guys st- stay relatively slim yeah. and um, stay in shape. And so that we were kind of joking about that. And some of our D linemen, I was saying, man, you you look good, man. I didn't know which way it was going to go <laughs> for you. I didn't know if you were going to, when you stop, you know, doing drills yeah. and exercising and just eating, the pounds pack on. So uh, it, it was good to see those guys, and everybody was – looked good and you know they're at great points in their life and I think that's just a testament to uh, the kind of people that we had when I was at USC and the coaching staff that we had and uh, just not even just the football people but the people in the uh, academic department and really just what they prepared a lot of us for 
uh, just in life in general and in, in life post football. Yeah. Um, like I mentioned, you've been at practice. You, how many practices have you been to? Like three, two? I've been three or four. I think I've, I think I've been to four, if you include uh, the scrimmage. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so yeah. what have you seen? What's your evaluation of this team so far? Jump right in. I'm right. sorry. Yeah, I'm, right I'm in, jumping right. in. So. Well, it, the team has talent. A USC football team is going to have talent. They're going to have speed. And what I would like to see, and I haven't, I've only been to a couple practices, and you can't have high intensity all the time. That's one of the hardest things to do. Even just as a human, it's natural to have off days. It's natural to be tired, to be sore. Uh, what I would like to see and what I'm interested to see how it uh, – you know, transfers over to the season, especially the first couple games, what intensity is the team going to play at? Because sometimes in practice I see them, you know, get riled up. They're playing with a ton of enthusiasm. And sometimes, you know, they're a little lackadaisical. It just kind of seems like they're going through the motions. And that's one of the toughest things to do, and it's something that great football teams do really well they're able to maintain a certain level of intensity all the time, and it just becomes a standard for them. And uh, that would be one thing that I think, especially USC, every team has its own individual kind of identity, every university. But USC especially, in my opinion, has always been, especially because it's in California, it's in Los Angeles, people always associate it with Hollywood. A USC football team has to be played with a ton of enthusiasm. Has to. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, they're playing music at practice, and I want guys to have fun, but at the, at the same time, they got to put the work in, and they have to have a certain standard that they always practice to. And that, that is something that I've seen it sometimes, and sometimes I haven't. And I can't lie, when I was in school, we struggled with that as well. So it would just be interesting to see how it transfers over to uh, the season. One of the big criticisms or people talk about with this team, uh, they would have like the no pads November. Yeah. Like we always report on, oh, they're in full pads today or they're in shells yeah. or there's no okay. pads. So that's like a big talking point on the message boards on yeah. Twitter. People kind of get into it a lot. What was the different, like, what does that change for you as far as practice intensity? Because I've talked to some players and they're like, you open the locker and it's full pads. You're like, okay, it's on today. Yeah. As opposed to, oh, another day with no pads, I can kind of take it easy. Okay, like, so, was it like that? Or? So I watched, when I watched uh, one of the previous episodes, you guys were kind of talking about this. And I was kind of getting fired up because yes. it's kind of a hot topic. <laughs> and so here's the thing, especially if you're talking about the difference between the NFL and college. The NFL... A lot of times you go half pads, you do things at a high intensity, full speed, but guys know how to practice. They know what the techniques are. To me, in college football, and you're talking about guys 18 to 22, some of them kind of have to develop these skills. They have to develop a certain work ethic. Okay. And that's one of the best things about, for me, and I know a lot of other guys going to USC was, we had a hell of a work ethic in practice all the time. and. This kind of goes to the intensity that I'm talking about because these guys have to know and understand what it feels like to be tired, to play physical, to run full speed into another person. And until they, honestly though, yeah, I mean they have that's to. That's the way I would put it. You have to run into another person. <laughs> well, I, yeah, run into them as fast as you can, and then that's that's my motto. I just run into them as fast as I can, and then I'm gonna see what happens. I just kind of leave it up to hopefully my size and weight will. will uh, um, uh, prevail, but uh, you know it's it's so important that um, these guys, you know, because they're impressionable, they're young, they're college students, it's their first time away from home, and uh, a huge difference is is these college coaches have so much more influence on these college players' lives than in the NFL. You're not going to tell uh, you know NFL players how they should act. In college football, these coaches are kind of there to kind of guide them. Yeah, to they're a like molding thing. them exactly. Like, yeah. And it's changed a little bit. And I don't know. I'm I'm 31, but I would like to think that I'm from more of an old school area or, or uh, era or an old school mindset in terms of I like the grind, rough, tough football. Yeah. The greatest football players of all time are all physical tough football players. That's why football is America's sport. Yeah. Because you don't have to be strong. You don't have to run a 4-3. You don't have to bench press 400 pounds. You just have to be tough. Football is the only sport that can represent an entire city with its yeah. attitude. Yeah. 
and um, my Steelers. Though, right that, exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. The Steelers, uh, Philadelphia, that kind of blue collar, tough, I'll fight you. <laughs> in a bar, well, not actually fight you in a bar, but this the mentality that's that's football, yeah. And um, I don't want USC to lose uh, focus of that because at the end of the day, like I was saying, being in it's not like Alabama who's in Tuscaloosa and those guys just grow up, you know, there's no other pro sports teams, there's nothing really going on here, there's so much going on, yeah. And I don't want the USC football guys to lose focus of. You know, at the end of the day, it's really just about you versus me, who's going to win. And you have to do things consistently in football to kind of really hone those skills. And um, this new kind of half pads, guys kind of practicing like they're in the NFL. I don't know. It, it could work. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, no, I'm not, I, and I'm not – it, it really right. could work. But you have to build a baseline. You have to build a foundation. I like old school Oklahoma drills. Do you need to run players into the ground and do uh, full pads every day for a month straight? I don't know. But um, you're not allowed to. But well, know. no, I know you're not allowed to. <laughs> not anymore. But see, that's the thing. But right. that does make a difference. Yeah. When I was in school, you couldn't do. Uh, you could do. Actually, I don't even remember. But <laughs> you, we, we would go out there, and you couldn't have a football. And uh, they would take a towel, put tape around it, and act as if, act as if it was a football. Oh, so would you do like the off-season workouts with coaches? Mm. And yeah, stuff? we yeah. would be out there running full speed with a towel, and you know, <laughs> and guys would be like almost tackling to the ground, and it just became a standard. It became what we were used to as yeah. a freshman coming in. You like getting scratched on the face. You don't have a helmet on, but it's just the norm for you. Yeah, and I think that's why we were so successful because. We had a standard, and we never wavered from it. Yeah. So on that note, when it comes to setting a standard, how much of that is from a coach versus just having players who have that mindset coming into a program? Is it a balance of both? Where do you see – where does that lie? So that's the tough part because it's it starts from the top down. I guess you could say it's a trickle effect. But at the same time, you have to have players. Players are the ones who are out there on the field. They're the ones who are in the huddle. A coach can only do so much. So it's really – it really has to be kind of the right number of both. And um, ideally, you would have players, older players, um, uh, Mike Pittman type players who have been through it. They know what it feels like. They know what it feels like to lose, what it feels like to win, what the work ethic should be. And those guys are the guys that you want setting the example for the rest of the team. Um, but it also can come down to coaches, too, and what coaches are willing to – Except sometimes a coach, like you're saying, will switch it up and say, we got to restart practice. That wasn't good enough. Or we're going to go full pads because I don't think you got – I think you guys are getting a little too soft. We lost a couple games in college, and we went full pads because Coach Carroll thought that, you know, we, we were playing a little soft. Yeah. And we needed to get back to the basics of what football is built on, and that's being physical. Yeah. So – we like that. That's one of the things we talk about is it seems like right now there's just always the plan and this, you stick to the plan. And I do like you're talking about 18 to 22 year old impressionable yeah, kids. Yeah, they're very impressionable. Yeah. And if things going wrong and we, you know, Coach Harvey Hyde is super old mm -hmm. school, but mm -hmm. he said weird things like he's thrown all of his assistant coaches yeah. off the field. Yep. Or he would, you know, uh, we've heard, I think Chick Kelly or something where they, they came out in no pads. They didn't like the intensity. Yeah. He I brought everyone that. back in full pads. Like, do something different yeah. to get you know get get your attention. You got to yeah. get the attention, and you got to keep players on their toes. And to me, so I I got drafted by uh, San Francisco 49ers when Mike Singletary was there, and this was before the lockout, so it was the old CBA, and you could go uh, full pads twice a day. So we went full pads <laughs> twice oh, a day geez. for a month with wow. Coach Singletary, wow. and Coach Singletary is nothing to play with. He's old school. He's smash mouth. He's, you know, run gassers and do Oklahoma drills all day. And <laughs> at the end of the day, you're going to be physical and you're going to be in shape. And so I think there's room for both because at the same time in, in defense of players, guys, you know, you don't – guys don't want to continue doing drills and wearing their bodies out and guys get hurt towards the end of the season. That's tough. Yeah. I mean, that, that you don't need to do full pads all the time. But in order to – they call the use the term like get a bone, get a bone thrown to you, get uh, you know maybe half pads or something like that. I think you have to earn it. So I don't think it should be something that's just given. I think it should be something that's earned. And then 
it's almost in a sense like you're keeping players on their toes. You know, did we do well enough today to earn half pads tomorrow? Gotcha. You know, and then you kind of keep them rather than just making it a standard norm. Because when you have half pads on mentally, you you don't think it's as physical. And that goes all the way back to when I played. I'm sure it goes back even further than that. There is a mental uh, hurdle in there that says, you know, we're in half pads. Well, you know, well, I know nobody's going to hit me in the leg today, hopefully. But <laughs> yeah. so there are little things. But I think you just really have to est uh, establish a standard for, you know, work ethic and physicality within the game. And then you can throw out the bones in a sense. Yeah. Um, Keely was watching some of the videos from your practice back, uh, you know, back in the late, you know, what, 2008, 2000. I was doing my research too. Mm, still a little research. <laughs> um, and she's like, I can't believe how many people were at practice. So this has happened again. It happened with Lane Kiffin for a little while. It's happening again now that uh, practices are closed yeah. to the media. They've actually closed practices to fans and stuff too. So that's, I mean, that's been happening for a while. But this is a kind of a new development as far as like starting a season with not being able to practice. Was having media or fans or anyone there a distraction for you? Or was it, I mean, maybe not you, but was, did some people not like it on the team and some people like it? Or what did you think of that? So I, I always thought that was something that was unique to USC was that, you know, and that, that goes back to we're not in Alabama, we're not in South Bend, Indiana, it's in Los Angeles, California. And that to me was always unique specifically to USC. Yeah. And for me at least, having people at practice, kind of can get you over that hurdle or that hump of, man, especially during a training camp when things get tough mentally and physically and you go out there and you kind of just see people and sometimes something small can kind of just be an initial push to kind of get you over that hurdle. And um, so I've never heard anything really negative about it in the sense of too many people being at practice and it being a distraction or guys being over there talking to their friends or anything like that. Yeah. I think most of the guys – realize and understand how important practice is and I don't think they would let anything like a distraction really get in the way I think it's almost like a mini game in a sense you know you have fans out there there's people there might you might have a girlfriend out there or something and you don't want to get embarrassed in front of right. her so in a sense it's you might play a motivated. little harder that's what I mean like you might <laughs> you might score a touchdown and go give her a ball or I don't know <laughs> something like that that's interesting because like it, I like the way you put that. It's something unique mm -hmm. to USC. Mm -hmm. and, and the defense will be, well, Alabama has close practices mm -hmm. and Clemson and all this stuff. And they do. Yes, Pete Carroll did it wide open. He didn't care what was going on there. But it, it was one of those things because you're in a sports town that has two major college mm -hmm. programs, you know, two NFL teams, mm -hmm. two uh, hockey teams, all that stuff, baseball, everything. There's so, you know, you got LeBron here. You got, you know, you've been in the World Series twice. There's so much other stuff going on. It just seemed to make sense to have practices open and be a regular part of the media and, and the church. But with closing practices, I think you're going to get less coverage. Yeah, I don't. Th I think you're kind of doing yourself a disservice. Now, a disservice. This, this is us. We're in the media. The kind of you know, mm -hmm. we would rather be out there mm -hmm. and stuff. We can't. But it, it's just what, the way you said it was perfect. It is something that's unique to USC. Like the people that are upset about USC scheduling an FCS school. <laughs> is it really that like? UC Davis might be better than UNLV, but mm -hmm. it's really one of those things that was unique to USC. Very. It was something that you could talk about. It's like a feather in your cap that's kind of being taken away. Well, so it's funny that you say that because there's a lot of talk about past teams at USC. And uh, I was reading an article and it was saying that uh, Jalen McKenzie was talking to Red Ellison about what practices used to be like during uh, when Red was there, when right, I was right. there. That was my article. Yeah, yes. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah, it was all right. It was all right. It was a couple, <laughs> couple pen, penmanship errors. But um, uh, penmanship. So, so the thing about it is, is that there are some things that you want to do and you want to carry over, and then there aren't. The team of 2019 will never be like the team of 2009, which will never be like the team of 1999. Each team has to have its own uh, identity you know, his own mindset, and you can't really fake anything, especially not in football. But as a university, there are certain things about each university that are special. Notre Dame, USC, Texas, there are specific things, reasons why recruits come to certain schools. And uh, I always thought that the open practices was just part of USC. And it's really to me why, you know, USC is – coaching job, I don't think it's for every coach. 
I, like I don't think Notre Dame coaching job is for every coach. It takes a certain kind of person to be a USC football head coach because it just comes with a certain territory, certain types of kids, kids from the West Coast. Um, it, it's just a different lifestyle. And, and I, would, I would like to, I think they should just embrace what USC football is uh, rather than maybe changing it. Do you care about the FCS thing? Was that a big, some, I talked to some players, a lot of them like, hey, this is terrible. Like some, people, some didn't care. I don't know if what you thought about it. Or. I, I don't, it doesn't, there's some FCS teams that could play. Yeah. You, you never really know. And I just look at it as the players should have the mindset that it doesn't matter who we're playing. Because there's some teams that are, uh, I, I don't want to name any teams, but there's some teams that aren't good teams. Yeah. You There's FCS schools that are better exactly. than the, like group of five schools. You can't yeah. play down to any team's level. You have to try and have the same attitude regardless of who you're playing, whether they're ranked higher than you, they're ranked last, they're a high school team. That's the attitude that I would tell those players. Don't worry about who you're playing. Worry about what you got to do and put in the same amount of work that you would put in as if it was any other game. Because you'll go into that game, you be complacent, They'll embarrass you. Something will happen. Even if you beat them, you're still not playing to the level yeah. that you should be playing. You're going to beat them by enough or so whatever. So don't even worry yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah, just go in there and do what you have to do and then move on to the next game. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have questions for Taylor, be sure to put them in the comments. I will we'll ask them. Yeah, uh, people done. are already uh, comparing which hit you had was the hardest. <laughs> 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 do you have an opinion of favorite hit or hardest hit? Like at, at USC? Or yeah. Oh, at USC? Yeah. I, maybe, um, yeah. Both? I, probably the biggest hit is uh, what happened in the Rose Bowl against Penn State because I hit two people. So people always <laughs> ask me about that. <laughs> and it's funny because in uh, Jordan Norwood, who used to play receiver for Penn State, he also played in uh, Cleveland when I was in Cincinnati. Oh, so wow. I saw him twice a year uh, uh, in the AFC North, and he used to joke about it. But probably that play. I don't know. There's The biggest hits for me probably were – hits that people don't know about, just kind of routine tackles where I hit somebody and I'm like, whoa. So sometimes and, you wake up like... Oh, well, yeah, I mean, just sometimes, like, uh, it doesn't show up as a big hit on film or, you know, people don't talk about it, but... You feel it? Yeah, because to me as a safety, as a defensive player, anybody can kind of run at a receiver that's not looking and hit them and knock them off guard. You could go... She could go... You could hit somebody that's, you know, off balance and knock them out and flex on them, you know? Sure. It's just, we got a picture of her in pads. We oh, come somebody. on, right? <laughs> but the, um, the biggest hits, the hits that I like are hits where maybe a running back is getting the shoulder square to the line of scrimmage and you're coming and hitting them. Something like that. That's so he's, more, he's ready for it. Yeah, he's ready like for it rather blood. than just kind of sneak attack. Yeah. You know, <laughs> a sucker punch. Makes right. sense. Uh, Jasper Smith on YouTube says, from your time at USC, which players do you still keep in touch with? Uh, so... I played with Ray for a couple of years in Cincinnati, so I, I kept in touch with Ray. Um, I've kept in touch with Brian Cushion. He was my roommate for three years. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. And uh, t uh, Thomas Williams, a linebacker. Yeah, yeah T-Will. He lives out here. And uh, so yeah. I talked to him a couple times a week, actually. Yeah, Ray does, too. Or he did. I don't know if yeah. he still does. But, yeah, they've come to a couple of our events, so it's yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've talked to a couple guys. Uh, Will Harris, who's a yeah. DB coach up at University of Washington. He's doing yeah, really well. Yeah, that's very also. cool. Yeah, and um, so I've been in, you know, contact with a lot of guys. It's hard because you go from, that's the thing about football, whether it's in college or the NFL, you go from hanging out with guys, especially in college, eight, nine months out of the year, and then all of a sudden they're gone. Or in yeah. the NFL, you spend, you know, 12 hours a day with guys, and then the off season comes and you don't see them for a couple months. Yeah. So it's a kind of a weird relationship, and you kind of just – you have a lot of history with people, and then you don't see them. It's like an awkward breakup. <laughs> it's like yeah. an intense relationship. That's what I'm saying. Very, yeah. yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Augustine on Facebook says, Taylor, have you considered getting into coaching? <laughs> well, it's funny that I, I really didn't um, think about coaching because coaches are there longer than the players are there. Yeah. You know, and I don't know if people realize that coaching is tough. It's a lot of work, yeah. Especially in college. I, if I was the coach, I would like to coach in college just because it's a little more personal, you know, like we were talking about, have a little bit more influence. I feel like I could uh, coach better in college football. Um, I had never really thought about it until I went to USC's football practice. Oh, really? So yeah, I, hadn't, I didn't think about it. 
until I went to USC's football practice. And you see, like Chris Hawkins out there, like yeah, I could do well, that. <laughs> well, yeah. well, and I know Chris too. Yeah. And I, uh, Coach Burns recruited me. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Coach Burns recruited me, but then he was gone uh, that next year. He went to Tampa Bay. Okay. But yeah, he recruited me. Uh, but I kind of was just, I hadn't really thought about it. And then when I was watching guys do drills and just little things that I was watching for specifically, I, I wanted to coach. Yeah. I was watching and I was thinking about it and it kind of just snapped. So I, I don't know. I don't know where that will go, but um, I think it would be cool just to, I, I love football. I love being around football. Um, I love the small things about football. You know, and I love training camp, not the, you know, the meetings and not that part, but just the <laughs> idea of it, you know, just the uh, camaraderie that goes on between the players, between the coaches. It's it's hard to find its equivalent outside of football. Yeah, yeah it doesn't it sense. doesn't really exist. And um, so that that I don't know, I guess we'll see. Speaking of coaching, we actually saw you kind of coaching up some of USC's players after practice. I, oh. I saw you talking to Hufunga, yeah. and what you don't have to tell us what you said to them, but what was that like talking to them and kind of coaching them up? I just was telling them that, well, when I was meeting them, and I've spoken to them, uh, what was that, three or four times um, after practice, and uh, I just was kind of telling them. The thing is, is I didn't want to act like I was going over there and telling them to do this, this, or that, because Coach Burns – he knows what he's doing. He's been around for a long time. He's coached great college players, and he's coached uh, players in the NFL. He knows what he's doing. So I didn't – I was very careful. But I just was telling him just small things that I thought he could do. Uh, and um, we were talking about the intensity of a drill, and I was saying to the corner specifically, you guys got to go and attack the wide receiver. Go and two-hand jam, punch him in the chest. Wide receivers should never want to block DBs. <laughs> should never happen. But until you guys practice it, yeah, you won't know what it feels like. Yeah. And once you kind of develop what it feels like to go jam a receiver and get him off you, you won't you it it'll never show up for you in the game until you practice it. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's just it's just a mind that mindset thing, it's a mentality, it's something that these guys it's hard to do and it's hard to do during training camp, but you just gotta get yourself over that hur hurdle, go out there, be physical. And then you kind of start to – I think the games will really go to the next level. But I was telling um, Isaiah and Talanoa. Yeah. Talanoa, yeah. Talanoa, yeah. Um, good kids. I like both of them. And yeah, both of them want to be good football players. Yeah. Especially Talanoa. I mean, he, he wants to be a, a great football player. And that's something that you can't teach. You can't coach it. You can't, you know, guys to be disciplined and, and want to do the little things. That's – you can't teach that. So um, – I just was telling him to just continue to do the right things. And if you do the work now, you'll put yourself in a position, you know, to really help you out later in life. And a lot of the skills that these guys are learning right now will be skills and mindsets and mentalities that they'll carry with them for the rest of their lives. The, that was before uh, the fall showcase. And we were talking yeah. offline. The DBs didn't have a great fall showcase, I guess you yeah. could say. Uh, I think there was you gave yeah I think you told me like a, one of the cardinal rules of what oh, yeah. DB what you can't do if you want to kind of explain that and what you saw well, maybe out there so one of the uh, I guess it's like sacrilegious if you get a deep ball thrown on you when I was in school Coach Carroll and it would sound it might sound dumb but he would make us stand up and and put our right hands up and pledge that we wouldn't get beat on a deep ball <laughs> and uh, Coach Seto every single day would talk about no seam no post. And I'm sure that Coach Burns says a lot of the same things because he's kind of he was there. Yeah, he yeah. was there and he, you know, well, he knows before, what it's yeah. like. Yeah, he knows what what that uh, those practices and what that defense is like. But it's just something that DBs have to learn. You can't win a football game by letting up deep balls. And sa safeties and corners, they can control a football game in a sense because <laughs> offensive coordinators use a stat called Explosive plays. It's any play over, like, let's say, 20 yards. Most explosive plays somehow or some, some way or another, the corners and safeties are involved. Whether it's a pass, whether it's a broken run, corners and safeties are involved. Yeah. So a long you, run, the safeties exactly, involved. Especially yeah. in a long run. Yeah. But even in a long pass, unless it's something in maybe a cover two where the mic is running in the middle of the field and they throw a bomb down the middle of the field, then the safeties aren't involved. But most explosive plays – Someone in the secondary is involved. So if your secondary is playing flawlessly, 
you really you're forcing the offense to have to you know do a 10 12 play drive to beat you yeah you're forcing the quarterback to have to make you know outside seven route which is a corner route throws to beat you and you got to do a lot of things in a row right you have to, to, do, to be yeah. successful so yeah. that's just one of those things that you want to be you want to be competitive and aggressive on underneath routes, especially with your corners. But at the same time, regardless of whatever else happens, you cannot let somebody catch a deep ball on you. Yeah. It's, it's not acceptable. We were talking about that. So we, before you came in, we were talking about the quarterback stuff. And that's, I thought, something JT Daniels did well yeah. in the scrimmage. He did do a lot of good things the, in a row. Yeah. He moved the chains uh, where some of the other quarterbacks, they had success, but it was like the big play on third and long. Yeah. And those were that's what you're saying. Like you can't give up that play nope. because you've you've all these good things you did on the drive now get erased because yep. you just gave up a huge play. It's the same thing as if you know you had a personal foul penalty or something, and they get a first down. You could do you could have the first first down, great for the defense. Second down, great for the defense. Third down, let up deep play, and it's really just a letdown for the defense. And that's that's if if you get beat get beat because the team out executed you or or they you know you didn't knock down the ball and went over your finger maybe one or two inches but don't get beat on a mental assignment and don't get beat because you weren't doing the right playing with the right technique as a safety or a corner yeah. you can't let wide receivers run by you if uh if mike Pittman's gonna you know jump he's about six two six three if he's gonna jump over a corner uh, downfield. Sometimes those plays are going to happen. He's a great player. Yeah, he looks like a NFL wide receiver already. Sometimes that's going to happen, but that's more of a maybe once every other game type of thing, rather than several times during the game. Gotcha. We actually have a live caller on the line. Ooh. Shall we go to him? Sure. Let's see. Okay. Let's see what we have <laughs> in store. Yeah, Hello, you're know. on live on television. Hey guys, what's up? What's up? <laughs> What's going on? Hey Taylor, I just want nothing much, man. Just want to say, big fan, brother, from San Diego. Much love. What's um, going on? Just want to, uh, two questions: one for Ryan, one for you, Taylor. Uh, Taylor, uh, is there a player you see on this defense today that kind of reminds you of yourself back in the day? A hard-hitting player, just great player overall. And for Ryan, um, am I crazy to think uh, for JT Daniels? I see a lot of Matt Barkley in him. I just see so many similarities. Thank you, guys, for, for the call. Thanks. Thanks, Cody. You gotta go first. Yeah, go ahead. You go first. It's funny that uh, he asked that question because I was saying to somebody that I played with uh, Kevin Ellison. Yeah. And Kevin Ellison was probably the most underrated player that we had on our defense. And our defense obviously had it was kind of like a who's who of college football. Cushing, defense, Ray, you know, Ray, Clay. Kalu yeah, Clay. I mean, we like we we had a ton of guys. And Kevin Ellison was probably our most productive player. And I look at Talanoa, and he kind of reminds me of him just in his attitude. I don't know yet as a player, but he reminds me of him in his attitude. And Isaiah, who uh, kind of plays free safety, he's tall, he's lengthy. Is I was bigger than Isaiah. Right, right. Yeah, and I told him You're that. You're pretty big. Yeah, I let him know. I, I was bigger than him. But the way he gets downhill and he gets downhill fast, I haven't seen him blow anybody up yet. But one of the hardest things to do is get downhill full speed, and he looks like he's willing to play fearlessly. Yeah. So I, if I had to, I would say Isaiah, I see some similarities there because he's long, he's lengthy. And it's just funny that um, with Talanoa that he kind of reminded me of Kevin Ellison in a sense because – he really could be the quarterback of the defense. Yeah. And if you have safeties who know what they're doing, you can, can – it's hard for linebackers. Linebackers have to play the run, play the pass, call the – it's just a lot going on. And safeties, you know, a little further back, they can watch the play develop. And, uh, you know, Isaiah and Talanoa, they have a, ch a shot. Nice. Uh, yeah, it's uh, – and if you guys remember Taylor back in the day, he was – Kind of a, you were pretty much a freak, right? You were just like big, strong, fast, yeah. and one of the like. Were you the fastest guy on the team? Yeah, I was. The... It's, it, they'll argue it, but <laughs> if you look who, at the forty who times, who no, was no, competing? No, no. I, I was faster. But who was competing with? There you, was like... no. There, there, <laughs> the other guys were competing <laughs> after. Seriously. Like, so who was second then? Who was third? Um, <laughs> second? I don't even remember. You don't. I didn't turn and look when they were. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I remember there were some races. Guys. I think we did. I think 
I don't know if they let us shoot it or anything, but I think you guys had a couple like races. We did some. They had some races, but we would do uh, forty times in the yeah. off season in the spring, just yeah. kind of as a prep for the NFL Combine. And some guys would race, and uh, but I was like. I'm like 230 right now. I was like 238 back then. So okay. I was a little You're about bit the same, yeah. Are yeah. you still got the speed or is that? Yeah, I think I still have the speed. I don't, you know, I say I do. Nice. So uh, the other part of the question, yeah, uh, sorry. similarity, sorry, yeah, with that. Well, they went to the same high school. I mean, Matt Barkley was like everybody's all American quarterback. Mm-hmm. He's, uh, and, you know, JT's a little bit more reserved. Like personality wise, I don't think uh, they're close, but their, their numbers as starting as true freshmen were nearly identical. Um, Matt had like, Big win, you know, he had the big win at Ohio, Ohio State. State where, you know, uh, JT didn't really have those kind of, I mean, he had a big win against Washington State, I guess you could say. They won 11 games last year. But, I mean, I think some of the skill set's similar. But, like, personality-wise, there's just, I think there's a pretty big difference. But there's there's definitely a lot of parallels in modern day and all that kind of stuff, starting as a true freshman. Yep. So, yeah. Thanks, thanks for that caller. Yeah, I don't think thanks. he said his name. but uh, It's Cody, I believe. Cool thanks, Cody, thanks, Cody, for the call. Thank you, Cody. Uh, Taylor, we had a lot of questions about the recruiting process for you. Uh, what was that like for you? Who was recruiting you at the same time as USC, and why did you ult- ult- ultimately choose USC? So for a long time, I wanted to go to the University of Miami. Sean Taylor, the late, rest in peace, Sean yeah. Taylor. Uh, he, was, he had always been my favorite player. He's 6'3", 230, huge safety, very physical. Uh, and then me and my dad went down, took an unofficial visit, and it was – it's literally from Seattle. It's as far as you can get yeah. in the United States of America. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that would be like you could go like so Maine to San far. Diego or Seattle it, to it Miami. It is very it's far. As far yeah. as <laughs> and uh, my dad had a, a relationship with Coach Carroll because Coach Carroll was in Minnesota when my dad played in Minnesota. Okay. So they had already known each other. And uh, USC just was pumping them out. They were really on top. Every, I mean, it just the aura around USC back then. And my dad played at University of Washington, so a lot of people expected me to go to UW. Yeah. When Tyrone, I mean, you were you were, where was it, which high school was uh, it? O'Day High School. O'Day, yeah, but in Seattle, right? Yeah, yeah Seattle. Yeah. So a lot of people wanted me to go to UW, but I went to USC because they I knew they were going to compete for big games. I loved football. I loved college football, and I just wanted to be a part of a program that I knew was going to be around the top. And when I went to USC and watched their practice, I said, "That's it." <laughs> really? Yeah, that's that. it. That's it. <laughs> That was it. Interesting. So yeah. in the same vein, someone said, if you were a recruit now, would you come into USC in 2020 based on what you've seen? Ooh. I know. Tough question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I would say that it depends what position you play, the relationship that you have. You can't attend a university based primarily off of coaches because here's the thing. And somebody uh, told me this back when I was getting recruited. You have to go to the campus and see if you could envision yourself walking around the campus. Like, I, I loved uh, University of Michigan, went to Michigan. I couldn't see myself in Michigan. Yeah. You know, it just yeah. in Ann Arbor, Michigan, it, it wouldn't have worked. I think you have to go to a school and kind of get the feel of it, get the feel of the team, with the locker room. It's hard with the coaches because you want to put faith in them, but you don't know what's going to happen. It's just part of the business. They could get fired. They could leave. Exactly. Whatever. Yeah. But I would say, depending on depending on what position, and if you look at like USC quarterbacks, and we look at JT, JT is going to get a lot of looks because he's a USC quarterback. Yeah. USC running backs, in terms of the NFL, are going to get a lot of looks because they're USC running backs. So really, in the grand scheme, with you know, the NFL and wanting to play post-college, USC more than any other school, maybe Alabama. There's a couple of schools that are up there. But USC is going to put a lot of guys in position to play football after college. And that was one of the main things for me. So I, I think it just depends. And I think it's on an individual basis of whether or not, you know, what what the opportunities look like at each university or at USC right now. That makes sense. We got a tweet from Steve who says, what was your favorite game while at USC and why? Mm. Your favorite one? It wasn't the Emerald Bowl, I'll tell you that. Not the, not the Emerald Bowl? No, it okay. wasn't the Emerald Bowl. My favorite game. Was that Boston USC. College? What was that? Was that? that was the Boston College. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you played Penn State in the Rose Bowl? Yeah, I would say that my favorite game, even though – and this this shouldn't be my favorite game because I got hurt. This is the first time I got hurt in college um, when we played Ohio State at Ohio State. Okay. Uh, but just to be in the horseshoe 
you know, and just the way that it went down and uh, Stephon Johnson scoring the touchdown and Matt Barkley being a true freshman quarterback in front of 112,000 people. That was a crazy That atmosphere. game was that, unbelievable. Yeah. I've never walked into a stadium and been intimidated. Yeah. When I walked into that stadium, not in college, not in the NFL, when I walked into that stadium, I, I it took me back for a second because I was like, man, this the way the fans were, it, it was – that was unbelievable. So to win that game was awesome. But you got banged up in that game, man. Yeah. yeah, I got banged up and uh, I tore my MCL and then I missed the first. That was the first game. That was the only game I missed in college. Oh, wow. Was that next game at uh, University of Washington and we lost. And um, so that was tough. But that's just part of football and life and, you know, things you have to overcome. Yeah. Joe McKnight in that game. Kev yeah. Yep. Was Kevin Ellison still? On? No, Ke Kevin was, he was there. Go, yeah. he, he Unfortunately, was both gone. of those guys have passed away, which is yeah. terrible. Yeah, I know. It's tough. It's, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we have a similar question. I think it's from Alan. He says, which opposing teams do you remember most, and were there any teams that you hated playing against? Hmm. So I'm not from Los Angeles, so the USC-UCLA rivalry – didn't really mean as much to me as I know it does for kids who are from the greater Los Angeles sure. area. But I don't like Notre Dame. Jimmy Clausen <laughs> was one of – so Jimmy Clausen, <laughs> after we left school, we had the same agent. Okay. So we trained for the combine together and became good friends. And I hated Jimmy because if you just <laughs> looked at Jimmy, you wouldn't, you wouldn't like him unless you know him. He's a great person. But uh, I hated him, hated Notre Dame. Um <laughs> Golden People Tate. Gonna love that, yeah. Golden Tate's another great player, but he's one of the players that I've tried to hit and he just ate it. Yeah. And I've never like it's always bothered me that that happened. <laughs> uh, so I would say Notre Dame is one of the only um, teams that I strongly dislike. I think Jimmy married a USC yeah, volleyball just, player. Yeah, just, yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. They got that USC yeah, they Notre got, Dame connection. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they have some arguments over. They have one of those flags <laughs> that's half USC, half. Oh, Notre very Dame. nice. I'm cool. sure they do. Nice. We yeah. had multiple questions wondering if you ever considered playing outside linebacker in the NFL. So I did play a lot of. Uh, they call it like a dime linebacker, like a nickel linebacker in the NFL, and that was something that I never really realized until uh, NFL offenses started like with. Travis Kelsey, Antonio Gates, and they started getting mismatches on tight end versus linebacker, tight end versus safety, because most safeties are six feet, 200 pounds, and I've always been somewhere kind of in between. So in San Francisco, actually, I started playing dime linebacker, and it was more of a matchup thing, and then I played it in San Francisco, in Cincinnati, and in uh, when I played for Oakland, also oh, under okay. Coach Norton, yeah. Oh, nice. So oh, it, nice. it is actually a really good position because uh, I don't have to backpedal. You know, I'm big, and that was always something that I hated doing as a DB was backpedaling, and it kind of gives me a little more freedom to just be in a two point stance and uh, you know cover tight ends, and it's 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 a good matchup. Yeah, there's some big bad tight ends in the NFL. There are, those, and they can run, and yeah. they're athletic. And it's just like a mismatch. The Gronks you know? of the world, exactly. Like the Kelsey like last Gronk. year, and Gronk is still a lot bigger than me. Yeah. But at least I can run with him, and I'm bigger than most safeties, and you know would be faster than most yeah. linebackers. So it's it's a tough matchup trying to you know cover a receiver like that. Is that weird? Just like receiver. wake it up and you're like, oh, I got to cover Gronk tomorrow. Uh, like this is gonna be like, you yeah. Know, where? Why am I doing this? Or what's going well, on? Well, yeah. It's, it's so <laughs> we played uh, when I was in Oakland. We were playing uh, San Diego. And I was covering Antonio Gates and Phillip Rivers as the quarterback. Yeah. And, you know, Antonio Gates has been playing for a long time. And the funny thing is, is I played uh, safety and Charles Woodson was other safety. Jeez. And Charles Woodson was the whole reason that I wore number two. Wow. So okay. it was kind of like a weird thing because Charles Woodson's over here, you know, tell, telling me this. And I'm Antonio Gates <laughs> over here. And they're both, you know, <laughs> Hall of Fame players. I've been watching them since I was in like middle school. Yeah. And uh, so it, that that was cool. A little I mean, surreal. Yeah, like a little up. bit. Yeah. yeah, it was pretty cool. Interesting. <laughs> MC on YouTube wanted to know if you remember uh, your first interception and what happened on that play. I don't – so here's the thing about me. I don't really get interceptions. It's a – I don't know if it's a negative. I never really look for the ball. I always go for the hit. Okay. So it's kind of <laughs> like an inside joke, but at the same time it's something serious. Some guys have a knack for being able to – see the ball, see where it is in relation to the receiver and when to step in and catch it. 
And some guys just go for the hit. And I've always been a guy that kind of just went for the hit. And I think every interception uh, that I've had has almost been by accident in a sense because <laughs> I just That's was in the right place at the right time. And I think in, I think in college, the first interception that I had, it was either against Oregon or it was against uh, – Washington, I think it was against Washington State, and it was on a yeah. Hail Mary at the end of the game. And oh, wow. I kind of, I wasn't supposed to catch it. I was supposed to knock it down. <laughs> so guys gave me. So the one time you yeah, got. yeah. So guys gave me a whole lot of, you know, they, they they didn't like that. They thought I was trying to pad my stats. But then. You're like, I don't get interceptions. That's my well, yeah, so I think I had like three interceptions my freshman year, and then I only had two interceptions the rest of my years after that. Oh, so, wow. um it's not like I was a interception receipt, uh, machine. Sure. Interesting. So that's sort yeah. of a choice you make, though. You're like, I'm going for the hit versus that. Like, I'm yeah. looking for the ball. I just – so sometimes you'll see DBs, even linebackers, they will try to catch the ball and miss time to jump or something. The receiver will actually catch the ball, and you would rather at least go for the hit and have it be an incomplete pass yeah. than – you know, go for the ball and and you can give up a big play if you don't get exactly. the interception. You give up big play. So I always uh, erred on the side of well, I just go for the hit, and then they start throwing penalties and you get fined <laughs> for helmet helmet contact. And then I was really like, well, now what do I do? So Did you get fined a bunch? Of I've them? been fined several times, yeah, in the NFL, and um, it's just hard. It's it's hard. It's it's hard how the game is changing. I don't know if in college football if I would have been able to play because. Now they're suspending players. Yeah, for like yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And I would have been in a little bit of trouble. Okay. But uh, yeah, I've been fined a couple times for helmet-to-helmet hits, and some of them were legit. Some of them I thought were shaky. But the NFL is pretty good about it. They they won't. You might get an initial fine, but if they don't think that you know at high speed when they're watching it or in slow motion, they'll rescind the fine. Oh, okay. Yeah, they'll take it back. It'll take a while to get your money back because you know <laughs> they take it fast, but <laughs> it'll take about three or four months to get your money back. But at the same time, they're they're pretty honest about it. Nice. Interesting. Um, Ulao Ulao on YouTube wants to know: Do you feel robbed from the NFL com combine forty yard dash? Yeah. So here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. That was a lot. So. I felt like I ran – what they told me officially, what they told my agent back then, was that I ran a 4-3-0 flat. Tr uh, Jacoby Ford ran a 4-2-7, and Trendon Holiday ran a 4-3-3. Initially, they said I ran a 4-2-4, and then they tried to say that I ran a 4-4-3. But when you watch the slow motion and guys running together, I finished second. And Jacoby ran a 4-2-7, and Trendon ran a 4-3-3. So they told me after that that I ran a 4-3-0. And I was up in, did it matter in terms of, you know, the NFL or anything like that? No, it didn't matter. But it's kind of bragging rights. Like, yeah, yeah. you train for years for the NFL Combine. And I felt like they kind of screwed me over a little bit because this brat, you know, like now when they show that stat, they still write 4-4-3. And I feel like that's a lie. And even though 4-4-3 isn't slow, especially for someone your size. being my size, yeah. 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 It's not a 4 Three zero, or what I would think would be the at least the maybe the fastest time for anybody that's over two hundred thirty pounds or something. Yeah, like yeah. That. So it, it's a little frustrating, but same time, when I talk to the NFL scouts and the coaches, they all had hand times because they hand time it, so yeah, they yeah. don't trust the no, they do their own. Yeah, every so one of them, yeah, exactly. They don't trust the NFL network either. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> they it, it's it's all right. Interesting. Now, when it comes to entering the draft and that whole process that you had, when you look back on it, do you have – would you do it over differently? So here's the thing. A lot of people say to me, well, I should have left my junior year. You know, I should have came out my junior year. And um, some of the hard parts about staying for my senior year were we just – we lost four games. You know, it just was – it just was a little bit different. Yeah. But at the same time, in reality, I was a better football player coming out after my senior year than I was – than I would have been my junior year. Okay. I think I had, like, 40 more tackles my senior year than I did my junior year. And I was a better football player, a more complete football player. Uh, even though I fell in the draft and, uh, you know, they say I would have won the first round after my junior year, I was a better football player. So it's just one of them things that you kind of just have to live and learn. And I don't even have any regrets. It's, you know, you wonder, but I, I don't have any regrets about it. Yeah. That makes sense. When it came to the draft, 
Did you, I know there were a lot of talk about Pete Carroll and what happened with that. Did you know what was happening as far as how that went? So, yeah, there was, and it kind of blew up a little bit initially, yeah. but uh, I was never mad at Coach Carroll, and I just saw Coach Carroll in April because I went up to Seattle and worked out. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. that. Okay, yeah. And uh, so, you know, we had talked before that, but it was never, I never thought, it wasn't that he didn't draft me and that he drafted Earl, because Earl made more sense for them to draft at that time. He's a great player. He really fit into what they were doing uh in that defense, I was mad that I fell to the second round. You know, that's more what I was mad about. Is it anybody's responsibility to tell me that I was going to fall to the second round? Probably not. Like, it's not – it just happened. Yeah. You know? But I think I just was uh, – I hate to admit it. I think I was being emotional in, you know, that moment. Yeah. And I just said something, and it kind of took off as something that – I said that was personal towards Coach Carroll. Why didn't you draft me as if I, as if he had promised me that he was going to draft me or something, which wasn't true. Yeah, right. I just was really – I was upset in the moment. You know, I came back from my senior year. I got hurt. Our team was mediocre for us. Yeah. And then I fell in the draft to the second round because, you know, you put in all that work for at that time in my life, 21 years or 22 years at that time, and – to follow the second round. Even though the second round is a great honor. Right, right. For me, it wasn't good enough. So, But it is just is what it is, and it's one of them things that you just have to move on from. Yeah. What is that process like just for going through the combine, interviewing with different teams and whatnot? What is that like for someone who's, like you said, 22? It seems like a, a big task. So that's – it's it's tough, and that's where – NFL scouts, NFL coaches, they're watching guys for everything. I mean, they're looking at how you treat other people. They're looking for work ethic. They're looking at the type of language that you use. Because if they're investing money in you and they're trusting you to represent their franchise, they're watching everything. Yeah. They're consulting people about you, asking them questions. I mean, it's pretty serious. And it can be overwhelming for a lot of guys because – you do meetings. I mean, you, you're talking to people, especially at the Combine or even at the Senior Bowl. You're going from meeting to meeting to meeting and kind of answering, answering the same questions, but you have to do it for 31 teams. <laughs> and it can be overwhelming, but it's to me it was always one of those things. I just was so excited to finally be experiencing it that I was willing – I would have did it with anybody. Yeah. You know, you were ready for that process. I was, ready, I was yeah. very ready for that process just because – uh, I'd always, you know, dreamed about and thought about, you know, the combine and the NFL draft and meeting with NFL teams, what I was going to say, things like that. And But it can be overwhelming, and I think that guys need to just be true to who they are and just be themselves rather than trying to make up some crazy, you know, responses to questions about, well, what do you think hard work is? And somebody going on a long tangent about <laughs> hard work is this or that. They don't have to do that because at the end of the day, your film's going to, uh, get you drafted. Yeah, it's gonna choose where you get drafted. They'll base it on your film, not necessarily on what you say. So right, that makes sense. You could probably eliminate yourself if you say something stupid. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. but exactly. But you're not gonna talk them into. Oh, I, I don't exactly. like it. He's not very fast, but exactly. he had a great answer to the. He word had a great. Question, he, so he we're gonna draft a great him. paragraph <laughs> on his questionnaire form. <laughs> so we're gonna draft him over. The Heisman Trophy one, you yeah. know, something like that. <laughs> they're, they're not really into that. Racer X on YouTube has an interesting question. He said, "Could a player as phys as physical as you be productive with the Pac-12 refs these days?" Well, I mean, it was probably hard back then. Yeah. It was hard back then, and I don't, I don't know. So, for me personally, it they'll tell you to go low. Like a lot of my coaches, especially in the NFL, would say target low, like aim for the center of his chest but it happens so fast and I would never I respect the game of football so I would never intentionally want to hurt somebody however to me going low and hitting a guy who's defenseless in the knees is worse than hitting him in the head yeah I don't want to hit a guy in the knee and blow both of his legs out so it's kind of I don't know which one to do do I hit him up top do I hit him low I don't want to get fined or get, you know, ejected. So it, it's a, it's that, that's a tough situation to be in. And I remember uh, 
talking to TJ McDonald about it. Oh, yeah. I think right after I left school and he had gotten in trouble for like a helmet to helmet hit. And I said, man, you just have to just try to lower your strike zone or your hit him in the center of the chest. Because what happens is the receiver catches the ball. You go to hit him in the chest, but then he drops Bends down, down yeah. you know, a foot and you hit him dead in the face mask. So to me, football is football. Let football players be football players. But at the same time, I can understand people's concern about safety. Was Glasses ref there when you were there? Do you remember that guy? Is that I, I'd have to see him. So a lot of the refs, I can remember if I see yeah. him. But is he? Does he had he, glasses. He's the one that had glasses. Gla oh, oh, glasses. That's his yeah, yeah. Oh, that's why you call him glasses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is he? Uh, he's like he's got a lot of famous memes on there and stuff. So oh, uh, does he like to throw the penalty flag? There's a lot of flags. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a. A Facebook question. Uh, you kind of touched on it already, Taylor, but he, uh, Jameson on Facebook says, will Greg Burns get these guys ready, especially the young ones, for the season? Yeah, I think Coach Burns definitely will get them ready. I think Coach Burns has coached, especially in college football, enough to know there's a difference in personalities every year and kind of just the camaraderie of a DB room. And it's funny because especially in football, each position group kind of has its own mindset, like receivers are, you know, really into themselves <laughs> and <laughs> O linemen are kind of, you know, they're they're like the mechanics that make the entire machine go. They don't get credit for it, but and then DBs are somewhere, you know, a compilation of everything else. And uh I think that Coach Burns understands that. I think he understands what guys need to do to be successful, what it looks like, what the what the work ethic, what the attitude looks like. And I think he's been conveying that to these guys. I think it's just hard because he has some young guys playing who don't have a whole lot of experience. And sometimes DBs can come together maybe halfway through the season and really start playing well. I think what Coach Burns is trying to do is get these guys to understand that you have to do this from the jump. Yeah. It has to be from the beginning. The only way that you guys can accomplish this is if you are practicing it all the time. You have to practice it all the time. You can't wait until you lose a couple games to feel like your back's against the wall and then play hard. Yeah. So that would be the – if anybody can kick them in the butt and get them going down the right path, uh, I think Coach Burns could do it. When it comes to the learning curve for young players, how fast can guys really get the hang of things? Like, what should USC fans expect from young corners? So that's uh, corners? Yeah, well, safeties too, but... Well, that's the... That's where we're talking about Talanoa and Isaiah. It just depends on players. So some young guys come in, and I think they think that they have a couple years to kind of get things going and figure it out. And some guys come in and they want to do as much as they can immediately. And I think there's a couple of both types. You know, and, and as long as the guys want to get better, I think they will. I think they just don't know what their ceiling is yet. And they have to be kind of shown this is what it looks like for you to practice at a high level. This is what it looks like for you guys to do the right technique. Talanoa asks all the right questions. Yeah. I mean, he asks all the right questions. He's not asking just kind of empty uh, questions. He's at, he's asking the right he's questions. He's a smart, smart. He yeah. And he wants to do this, too. Like, he, I remember I interviewed oh, yeah. him in Hawaii for the Polynesian Bowl, and he, I think he's communications major, yeah. and this is something oh, yeah. he's really right. – and he's, like, really good. I'm like, I let him interview a couple of the players yeah. there and stuff. <laughs> so, like, yeah, you're going to have our job one of these days. You know? yeah. yeah. So when you have guys like that, it's like the trickle effect. It'll rub off on other guys. So you want somebody that's setting the example. I was telling, um, I won't tell you who the corner is, but uh, when I was at practice the other day, it was a corner, really a nickel. He was running downfield, and he was tired, and he started. He came back to the sideline, and he tapped the top of his helmet. And I, I kind of snuck over there, and I was saying to him, I said, you know, hey, man, unless you – are getting paid $10 million a year to play for the <laughs> Chicago Bears, you can't pat the top of your helmet. You're a DB. You're playing nickel. You're going to get tired. You have to get used to being tired right now. You have to know what it feels like because there's going to be, I'm telling you, a ton of plays this season where you're going to have to run downfield 50 yards, come back to the huddle, and play man-to-man -man coverage again. Yeah. You better practice it now and know and understand what it feels like. And that's part of the mindset, the attitude that I think especially – especially defensive players, safeties, anybody, 
on defense, but that's what I've been talking about. Those guys need to develop that attitude where they're kind of – it's us against the world. Chasing that little slot receiver around. Exactly. All, all that's, 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 that's tiring. <laughs> was said player receptive to your message? Oh, yeah, he was cool. Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And so he uh, he understood, and I think that's just – I don't know if that's where – there's some things that get lost in translation. I think nowadays, especially in football, with things like social media and all these guys having all these photos of themselves and the thing with the gloves where they do the hand, the all that SC, stuff. Yeah. yeah, like, you know, it, it's changing a little bit. It's getting, as the world gets more modern, football and guys are changing a little bit. And football is about working hard and having a foundation that, you know, you, you've really put in the work. So these guys, just they just got to put in the work. Yeah. Old school Taylor That's Mays. what I'm talking about. <laughs> a little bit. Old great. school. In that sense, what, how do you think social media would have impacted your teams, your USC teams back in the day? We talk about that a lot. Uh, guys will talk about, like, if, man, they, if I would have had Instagram back then, like, I could have done, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they go off on a, on a tangent a little bit, but. I don't know how that how it would affect. I think that social media is it's dangerous. So a lot of times, like I see a lot of athletes who post videos of themselves working out, telling other people that they're working hard. And I tell I was telling some of these young guys, I'm saying there's a huge difference between telling people that you're working hard and actually working hard. Don't be one of these people, especially in the city of Los Angeles, that just wants people to think that they're working right, hard. Right, right. You don't get need that Instagram shot perfect exactly. to show how hard I was working. You do yep. not need to. Don't worry about the, that stuff. Just do the things that you know you should be doing. Yeah. And so, you know, social media can be the greatest thing in the world or the worst. It just depends on the relation to how the person treats it. If they take it seriously or if they're taking care of the things that they need to take care of first and then they're using social media on the side. But yeah. that always bothered me about athletes. Athletes are supposed to work hard. You don't get a pat on the back in football for working hard. Everybody works hard. Yep. Gotcha. Old school mindset. That's what I'm saying. Should we uh, – We actually have a live caller. Can oh, we okay. – okay. sorry. Yeah, we can We can probably wrap up and let them get out of here. But yeah, sure, we'll do yeah. The call we have a call. I, Kyle, I believe he's been on the line for 20 minutes. I'm sorry, oh, yeah. Kyle. Oh, but sorry, you're, Kyle. you're live on Tunnel Vision. Yeah, it's okay, Keely. I'm Kyle, and I'm calling from Columbus, Ohio. Oh, see uh, us. Yeah, it was great to hear about that 2009 game was amazing. It was awesome. Yes, it was. Um, so ever since JT was named a starter on Tuesday, if you pay attention to anything on social media, he has been getting roasted, to keep it lightly. And people think that, you know, there's some conspiracy against Spears or Jack Sears, and everyone's saying all these negative things about him. And I'm just curious to think, with our running backs like Stephen Carr, Malpei, you know, Marcus Sepp, like Marquis Sepp, like what do you feel needs? What do what do we are so stacked at every position? So what do you feel needs to change in 2019 to make us more competitive? I just don't understand why we're last year was we went five and seven, but it was not JT's fault. So yeah. why is he getting dragged under the bus for all this? I'll go for it if you want, but it, real quick, yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100%. Last year wasn't JT's fault. They bring so many offensive skill players back. The wide receiver core, best in the Pac-12, mm -hmm. probably top three in the country. You love all the running backs. The offensive line, you still worry about, you know, like, like a Josh Follow, I think, is one of the more athletic tight ends you're going to find. And last year, I think it was more of the offensive scheme than what JT Daniels was doing. I, I think now you put a real competent offensive scheme together, and he's going to shine. Whoever was named the starting quarterback, I think, would have done a lot better. But I do, I do think it's a lot of the criticism of JT Daniels is unfair. They're kind of blaming him for the five and seven season. I, I don't put that on his shoulders. I think you're going to see JT Daniels, who, like I said, had similar numbers to Matt Barkley when he was a true freshman, just blow it out of the water as as a sophomore. And you're like, oh. Running in the air raid, like a real competent offensive system, that benefited JT Daniels. So he he wasn't as terrible. He looked as good as Trevor Lawrence did when we were at the Army All-American Bowl, and Trevor Lawrence won the national championship. He's not as bad as the, the people, the critics are, are making him out to be. Yeah, I would say that the thing about football is is you have to treat, the like he's getting roasted, he's saying online, getting roasted. You have to treat it, the good and the bad, the same. And that's something that being a USC quarterback, you have to do because the same people that are going to tell you you're the greatest in the world 
are the same ones that are going to tell you you suck. <laughs> you know, that's just how it is. It's happened yeah. to me. It's happ it really happens to everybody. Yeah. Regardless of how good you are, there's people out there that think LeBron James is a terrible basketball player. Right. You know, regardless <laughs> of how good you are, it always happens. No. And football is played, football is the only sport that's played primarily for respect. I think that JT, he'll do the right thing if he's playing the game for respect from his teammates and from his coaches. Because we, not being on the team, not being the coaches, we don't really know what's going on. We don't know what's going on in the locker room. We don't know what's going on in every single play. We just see it from the television. The guys in the locker room, the coaches, uh, the players, they know what's going on. So that's the respect that you play for because the respect that can come from your teammates is the greatest respect that you can get as a football player. And that's why guys play because the other players, they know what it's about. They know how hard it is. And that's one of the most fulfilling things that can come from football. And I think that if JT uses that as his standard, he'll be all right. He can't listen to the other people on Instagram because that's just a uh, – but I wouldn't read either of them. I wouldn't read the good or the bad, and that would be what I would advise, advise yeah. him to do. It's yeah. funny. Like, we, we put the show up on Facebook, and the first comment was something negative about you. Like, you're an All-American. Like, yeah. you were drafted second round. Yeah. You played the NFL for years, and yeah. somehow they're like – you suck or something. Like, okay. Like, I don't it, know it what. Happens. It happens. It's bizarre, you know. Yeah. It happens. But it's just, it's just a part of the thing. And so you have to be able to – I remember always saying, regardless of what team I played on, I would say all I care about is what my position coach, my defense coordinator, and my head coach thinks. That's it. Yeah. And that's what I would say. JT's going to be all right. He's got Graham Harrell with him. He's going to be all right. Yeah go off that and everything will take care of itself yeah thanks for the call kyle thank you kyle From for the call bus wow mm -hmm. ironic um before we wrap it up taylor what's next for you what's life like for you right now <laughs> well i'm back in i was in uh sausalito california beautiful. bay area beautiful. i was up there, up there. For yeah. Yeah. yeah and like i said i went to uh seattle in april and worked out so i thought i was in a go home basically so you were play. trying to still trying to make a team still trying to play, free yeah. agent right yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um and then that uh, obviously didn't happen so now i'm on to the next thing i don't know yet we'll see i'm working on it maybe yeah. uh maybe i could uh maybe i'll get better at doing college football games or talking about something or maybe i'll coach Hey. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I mean that's how that's why yeah. you're here like we yeah. you know reached out and we we're like yeah. yeah that'd be great to have you yeah uh, come so, on and uh, and see how you like it and see, you know, be fun. We'd love to have you on some yeah. other stuff, too. But it's funny that you go down to practice like, oh, I could coach. Too. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Both. I know. But the coaching thing is hard because, you know, with coaching, it, it there's so many other things that come with it. There's a lot of uncertainty. You know, it's out of your control. Then you have to worry about is offense playing well. Are we going to win games? Is So that that's. Something to take into consideration. Did you talk to Will Harris much about it, how he likes it, or is it? Uh... Yeah, I've talked. He, yeah, he liked, and he's been doing it for a couple years, and uh, he, 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 he's he's a good football coach. He knows what he's talking about. He's into. He loves his players. So I've talked to him about it, but there's just other things that come with coaching, recruiting, you know. But I, I don't know. We'll have to see what happens and see how it plays out. I think Demetrius right. He was. Yeah, D right. He was there. Was he? Was he? Is he at UCLA right now? He was coaching. I think he was doing some seven on seven. I don't know where he's coaching now. But did you guys have any overlap, or would he come? Oh in? yeah, he coached me for a couple of years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he coached with Coach Seto for, I think, my first two years, and then Coach Richard, who's now in Dallas. Yeah. He coached the rest. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Well, we wish you the best in, in all of your endeavors, and we thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, yeah thanks, thank man. you for having me. Appreciate it. Of thanks course, for coming of on. course. Okay, well, that's going to wrap it up for today's show. Ryan, when are we back? <laughs> uh, I think we might do Sunday afternoon. Really? Um, I think so. We'll okay. see. Well, we don't have to. We'll, News we'll figure to out. me. <laughs> Maybe not. We'll, we'll, we'll let you know, but uh, it yes. might be next Thursday. I think we're going to try to get on the Thursday, Sunday yes. schedule. Sunday 6 night. Yeah, 6, 6 a.m. <laughs> well, the, we, you know, a lot of people watch this on replay. Yeah, but yeah, the live yeah. thing is neat because we get the interaction you the can, callers yeah, with and stuff. Live calls and all that stuff. But Sunday stuff. night, like, we just killed it. We hadn't done a show for a couple of weeks, and we had, we had, huge, we had like, 600 people live. And oh, it was wow. kind of crazy. So 
And, you know, there's thousands of people watching afterwards, but to get those kind of live numbers. So I think Sunday night's like a sweet spot. Yeah. And I, we had pretty good numbers tonight, too. I think Thursday night, you know. Yeah, also no having Taylor. Anymore. No yeah, Game true. of Thrones on. There. True. They yeah. We're not competing. Yeah. But Thursday for sure. And that will be a, a Fresno State preview because oh, yeah. college football is back, which dun, is pretty dun, crazy. Dun, 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 dun. All righty. But that's going to wrap it up. That's Taylor. That's Ryan. I'm Keely. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.